But it all begins in 1515 with the death of Louis, the French king. You see, I had arranged and worked so hard to establish the treaty of the perpetual peace between England and France. But a peace ends with the king. It does not belong to the country. So when the Duc de Angevis, uh, Francis, comes to the French throne, we have to negotiate a new peace. Our links with France had been tenuous to say the least, and they had been held in place by the marriage of the old French king to Henry's beautiful younger sister Mary. But of course that marriage ended with the death also. And it didn't help that Charles Brandon, who went over to bring Mary back, tarried there and married without permission. That was an international disaster waiting to happen. Anyway, it turned out that Francois, the French king, he was about five or six years younger than Henry. And of course, he'd come to his throne about five or six years after our king had achieved the throne. And so it was decided that between these two great monarchs, there should be a treaty of universal peace. And I recall it was in the autumn of 19 when this was decided we should have a summit meeting between the two great princes in the summer of the following year, which left me barely six months to arrange it all. Now, of course, I was very good at buttering people up. I had buttered up the um, the mother of the French king, uh, Louise of Savoy, when his first child was born to Queen Claude, they named him Henry. There was no greater honour than to have your great rival for a baby name. I sent a christening present of £100, unheard of. But it did the trick, you see, I was in favour. I was the most popular cardinal in the the Roman Empire. So an inferior prince should travel to the superior prince's court for any meeting. That's the, the way it is set down. But neither of these two men wanted to admit that one was inferior to the other. So we came up with a compromise to meet each other halfway. And the Field of the Cloth of Gold, or the Camp de Drap d'Or, as it was called, would be just outside the Pale of Calais, which was uh, England's territory in France. But nevertheless, it would be close enough to the, the, the English territory to be satisfied that we were on neutral ground. Basically, I was the greatest picnic planner in history. There were to be 5,000 Englishmen or so crossing the Channel. In Henry's own party, there were 4,000. My God, the Archbishop of Canterbury, five bishops, two dukes, a marquis, ten earls, 20 barons. The food and drink alone for the month-long period, for the English, we're not talking about the French side, they can cater for themselves, was extraordinary. £8,000 in food and £1,500 in wine and beer, um, the list, it's all about lists, 700 conga eels, we liked an eel, 2,000 sheep, 26 dozen heron, a bushel of English mustard because Henry can't abide French mustard, um, and a pound's worth of cream for his cakes. Can you imagine how much a pound's worth of cream? It must have been more than two tons worth of cream. The biggest logistical nightmare was the transportation from England to France of all these people and horses. I mean, there were nearly 3000 horses involved in this, and many of them were the large Neapolitan um, breed, which the English knights favoured for the jousting. They realised that they would need armour and they would need spurs and they would need stirrups and things to be made. And so they... Um, they dismantled the steel mill at Greenwich Palace and transported that out. That was rebuilt at, at Geen Castle. Now, I was the first to go across, of course, because I had to organise all this. Um, and I did look magnificent when we disembarked and rode through Calais. I had 50 mounted gentlemen 
went before me in my scarlet and crimson colours and um, I had ushers bearing golden maces. They were the size of pumpkins, large pumpkins. And then in front of me on my um, beautifully decked donkey was a, my gold cross bearer, bejeweled. It's a beautiful, beautiful relic and it's something which which people just bow down when they see. And of course, there were <clears throat> dozens of lackeys and bishops and churchmen. The grand prior of the Knights of Jerusalem was in my entourage. And also we needed some soldiers. So I was allowed to handpick a hundred men from Henry's troop of about six or seven hundred. I had a hundred handpicked mounted archers wearing my tabards, my colours. <clears throat> This was my procession. And of course, well, the English, the English looked marvellous. It's all about the marching order. And Henry stayed for several weeks in, um, in Calais and rode out to mass every day. And I meticulously wrote down the order of the march so that he would look marvellous. Everything I did for the field of the cloth of gold was to make him look splendid. And it worked. The two monarchs met. It's history now. And they shook hands. They embraced. It was a marvellous sight to see. And I received the plaudits from the Pope and from all the civilised countries in the world who realised that I had stage managed this. Basically, the field of the cloth of gold had satisfied my own sovereign's weakness for an extravagant show where there could only be one star despite the fact that all these celestial bodies had attended and the star of the show it wasn't me it was henry